third of our clinical updates, please invite Michael Roberts up, he's a GP at Kidinia and also at the Sexual Health Clinic at, at Geelong Hospital. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Michael Roberts. Uh, I work at the Sexual Health Clinic at the Geelong Hospital and uh, also at Cardinia Health in Belmont. Um, the brief talk uh, we're going to cover this morning uh, is the screening and management of mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, this is, uh, well, I find it a really interesting topic because um, it's, a, it's a difficult organism and you'll see why in a moment. Um, so uh, it's, it's been identified relatively recently as a pathogen um, and as such um, our response to it is, is uh, rapidly changing. Um, it's known, like chlamydia, to cause urethritis and cervicitis. Uh, it's also um, associated with PID, proctitis, tubal infertility, preterm delivery and miscarriage. The like uh, chlamydia, uh, it's detected with a nucleic acid amplification test. Uh, in practice, that for males uh, is a first pass urine, the first bit of urine when people haven't passed urine in the last hour, preferably two. Uh, for females, um, uh, a endocervical or vaginal swab is superior to a first void urine. Uh, the vaginal swab can be um, clinician or self-collected uh, by the patient. Throat infection is uncommon and rectal carriage, whilst common, uh, is usually asymptomatic. Uh, we can't do a culture, um, but fortunately most laboratories will report on the presence of a gene that represents macrolide resistance. Um, so, uh, so if they uh, detect um, mycoplasma genitalium, uh, there will often be um, the, uh, a comment saying that this gene was uh, detected, uh, indicating that macrolides won't work. Uh, which is a problem because most of the time uh, this gene is detected. Uh, so in heterosexual infections, uh, about 50% will have macrolide resistance. Uh, and in men who have sex with men, uh, we see macrolide resistance in about 80%. Uh, they were figures from 2016. It's actually probably worse now. Uh, so, uh, we test patients with symptoms. So if people present with dysuria discharge, proctitis, pelvic pain, intermenstrual or postcoital bleeding, um, these are the patients that we want, in addition to your normal STI screening, to uh, request a mycoplasma genitalium NAT test. Uh, we also test um, infected patients' regular or ongoing partners. Um, this is to prevent reinfection of the symptomatic patient. Uh, we currently are not recommending screening of asymptomatic patients. So it's not part of a routine STI screen. It is part of a uh, testing of patients that are presenting with symptoms, but it's not part of an asymptomatic STI screen. So the treatment. Uh, for the macrolide susceptible, uh, we use a week of doxycycline, 100 milligrams BD for a week, followed by azithromycin, 1 gram stat, 500 milligrams daily for the following three days. It's worth mentioning that this is a non-PBS quantity of azithromycin. For the macrolide resistant, which is, I guess, what we see more of, uh, we also give the loading dose of doxycycline, 100 milligrams BD for a week, uh, but we follow that with a quinolone in the form of moxifloxacin, 400 milligrams a day for a week, longer if pelvic infection is present. Moxifloxacin is not PBS listed, um, and a course of moxifloxacin will cost um, between 100 and 150 dollars on a private script. If the patient is unable to afford that, then um, 
they uh, can be sent to uh, either Melbourne Sexual Health or to the BRASH clinic at the, um, uh, at the hospital, the sexual health clinic at the hospital, and the uh, clinic there will subsidise the moxifloxacin. Even with these regimes, the, the doxycycline um, uh, is quite ineffective, but it's designed to reduce the bacterial load and therefore make the macrolide or quinolone more effective. But even with these regimes, we see failure rates uh, between 10 and 15%. Uh, for those patients, um, we, uh, uh, they're a problem. Um, so uh, those patients will need to be seen at a, a specialty clinic, either at the sexual health clinic at the hospital or at Melbourne Sexual Health. Um, the hospital needs to put in a, uh, a special access application to the health department to import pristinomycin um, to treat these patients. Um, that's a bit of a process and it's not a cheap one either. So we want a test of cure done on infected patients. Um, two weeks after the completion of treatment, usually that means at the four week mark, uh, we advise the patients for uh, not to have uh, any condomless sex until the test of cure has proven that they have cleared the organism. No sex with previous untested sexual partners. Um, and I should also mention that this is not a notifiable condition at present. So how does this alter your management of your sexual health patients? Well, for the symptomatic patients, I would like you to be uh, adding in mycoplasma genitalium NAT um, to your STI screening. Um, and if you are um, going to give a uh, empirical course of antibiotics, some in the past might have given azithromycin, which would be very reasonable, but we don't want you to do that anymore. We would like you to start with doxycycline 100 milligrams BD, review it a week, and if it turns out to be chlamydia, well, the doxycycline is an adequate course for that um, condition. If it turns out to be gonorrhea, which we're seeing a lot more of nowadays, then the patient can be given azithromycin or keftriaxone as per the antibiotic guidelines. Um, and if it turns out to be mycoplasma genitalium, then the macrolide or quinolone as we've discussed. Um, as, um, so it's, um, yeah, it is a bit of a bother. Now, if you keep, um, if you want to keep up to date with the changing guidelines, because they do change, um, these are some useful uh, websites. Uh, the top one is run by ASHAM. Uh, the bottom one is the Melbourne Sexual Health Group. Um, they will both give um, patient information sheets and, uh, and also keep uh, up to date with, um, uh, with our management guidelines, uh, which yeah, have changed a fair bit over the last uh, one to two years. Any questions? Is yeah. This is, um, I, so Jan is um, saying that uh, this is a, a, a likely a commonly carried organism um, and that uh, where do you draw the line in treatment? Um, and, and it's in recognition of that that we only are interested in treating the symptomatic. Um, and uh, there is a lot of asymptomatic carriage. Uh, it's common in the bowel. Um, we, are, we are not... So, so, for instance, uh, we are not trying to contact trace um, people who have been exposed to mycoplasma genitalium. If people have um, been exposed in the past and, um, and don't have any symptoms, we're actually not interested in treating those individuals. Um, but we are interested in treating 
the ongoing and regular contacts of people who do get symptomatic with this particular organism. But the chlamydia is very common, so I guess somebody who has got symptoms, so three men, chlamydia comes straight positive, and then when I test for mycoplasma as well, that might come back positive as well because we've got 80 percent carriage, right? Which one do I use that? No, sorry, the 80 percent is 80 percent macrolide resistance. Not no, 80. no, I mean, the, the carriage rate in the population, at least in the Americas, is as big as more than 80 percent. So everybody got it. So which one do I treat? The, um, the uh, uh, chlamydia, or do I then go through all that rigmarole and try to get the end? If they've got, um, so Jan's saying if you've got uh, chlamydia and mycoplasma genitalium positive in a symptomatic patient, um, which do you treat? We, well, fortunately, um, if you treat the uh, mycoplasma, you will definitely treat the chlamydia. Um, you could just treat the chlamydia and see if, they, if that rids them of their symptoms. Uh, that would be an option. Um, if you're going to do that, we'd really prefer you to be using the doxycycline course because our stat doses of... In the UK, um, they never embraced stat azithromycin for chlamydia. They kept with the doxycycline. It was a lot cheaper, suited the National Health Scheme, but, in, but, but we wonder whether that is... Um, they don't have the same levels of macrolide resistance in their mycoplasma genitalium as we do, and so we... Uh, hypothesize that the, that, that the um, using the longer courses of doxy um, have, been, um, have been protective in a way of uh, um, from developing macrolide resistance. Maybe all of our stat doses of azithromycin for chlamydia and possibly mycoplasma genitalium has led to this macrolide resistance problem. Um, so yes, you could. You could just treat the chlamydia where, where very confident of chlamydia as being a pathogen um, and see if their symptoms go away. But if they don't, then you'll need to treat the mycoplasma genitalium. That's how I'd su suggest we manage that. This is not an uncontroversial area. Um, related, sorry, over here. But ah, over here. Sorry, yes, um, speaker, the, re the re microphone wins. Yeah. Um, related to that question, I've had advice um, about a year ago, so everything changes in this space, um, to where you've got someone who's going to be engaged and you could follow up doing initial test for chlamydia gonorrhea, and if that comes back negative or if they're not improved, then to test for mycoplasma. Oh, in a symptomatic patient? Yeah, in a symptomatic patient. Does that seem like a reasonable approach? Uh, yes, you could do that. Um, I, uh, I, well, we're not doing that, but, um, but you could do that, and that would save the issue of um, could the mycoplasma be an asymptomatic presence? Um, so, yes, in the, in the absence of chlamydia and gonorrhea in a symptomatic patient, um, then you work towards uh, mycoplasma genitalium, yeah, yeah, that would be not unreasonable. Thank you. Um, just you mentioned if you treat empirically, is that something we should be doing? Because I don't normally. I normally, if I get symptoms, I do the swaps, get them back for results. The, um, it is the, um, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, it probably depends on the severity of the symptoms. Uh, if people are really uncomfortable with their um, uh, with their discharge, or um, or if they're getting pelvic pain, or um, uh, I would then treat. But if they're if they've got grumbling symptoms that they've uh, endured for a number of weeks or longer, um, then I think it's entirely reasonable to uh, and appropriate to hold off until you know what you're treating. Um, but if someone's distressed by their symptoms, then some, some doctors, including myself sometimes, will use empirical therapy. Um, so. No? Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>